everybody and welcome to the Brown County Historical Society for a special e event tonight. And tonight we will be doing the Bits and Bites of History Snapshots of New Ulm. But before we begin, I would like to tell you guys about a few events that the Brown County Historical Society has coming up. Quite shortly, we have our book sale in April. This will begin on the 13th for our members and continue through the 14th and the 15th of April. And then on March 30th, we will be celebrating Women's History Month. And with that, we will have our Do Tell event. If you would like further information on these events, more information is available over at our table over there. But I think I left something out for you guys. My name is Lauren, and I am the new programs coordinator for the Brown County Historical Society. And we have three special guests tonight, but we also have a fourth special guest to introduce these special guests. <laughs> <laughs> and so, without further ado, here is our first special guest, <laughs> Professor Vagans. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, for those that don't know, I'm Professor Peter Boggins. I'm a professor of history up at Martin Luther College, but also I happen to be the uh, secretary of the Board of Trustees here for the Brown County Historic Society. And that's kind of what made this whole event possible tonight because it just made a perfect partnership in this case because I have a group of students and uh, a course that I taught this fall was on the history of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. For those that have no idea what that means, uh, basically it's the history of about 1870 to 1920 here in America. And 1870 to 1920 happened to be a tremendous period of growth for Brown County and for New Ulm. And uh, this partnership worked great then because I was able to give my students an opportunity to do some, some real research, getting into primary documents by using the uh, research library here at the BCHS. And uh, I saw Darla back here a little bit before, our research librarian who was a tremendous help to them. She like knows everything in that library. And uh, they were able to come up with some really interesting topics. And uh, there's eight, actually eight students were in the, co the class. But we went with these three because they all have topics that really have not been researched or included very much in books on the county. So it's an opportunity for you to really hear some, some different stories about Brown County and New Ulm history that you might not have heard before. Uh, so with that, first student presenter we're going to have is Noah Worcester. He happens to be a, a senior right now at Martin Luther College and uh, is training to be a, a history teacher in our middle schools and high schools. And he's going to be telling you about the uh, New Ulm tornado and the aftermath of that, which led to the building of our first hospital here in New Ulm. So, Noah. Thank you. Uh, it's my privilege to uh, talk to you this evening about the 1881 tornado that went through New Ulm and then the uh, subsequent hospital that was built in response. Clicker's not on. <laughs> All right, here we go. And so uh, part of my research, uh, it involved connecting the tornado in New Ulm with other natural disasters that happened in the Gilded Age, and then also instances of hospitals uh, coming from those disasters. And so the two that I chose was the uh, Johnstown flood in Pennsylvania in 1889, and then the Great Chicago Fire that happened in 1871. So first, the uh, Johnstown flood. It happened on May 31st, 1889, after a series of heavy rains. And the South Fork Dam on the Little Conema River, it had failed. And uh, it was about an hour upstream. So of course, it's impossible to stop something like that. And after it had failed, an hour later, it struck the town of Johnstown and it killed over 2,200 people. And up to that point, it was the largest loss of civilian life in US history. 
uh, caused a lot of damage. You can see there uh, the monetary amount, over 500 million in today's economy. And uh, regardless of the econ uh, economic disaster, it also uh, caused a lot of deaths as we see. And uh, there was a huge necessity for a hospital afterward. And so with all the injuries and the death, um, they started the Bedford Street Hospital. It was just this startup hospital that they ran for about a month to cure uh, all of the injured. There were thousands that were injured and the current hospital at the time obviously could not handle uh, such um, heavy treatments. So they started the second hospital. And the Great Chicago Fire, this happened on October 8th, 1871 when a barn caught fire and it spread rapidly, and it spread so quickly because uh, Chicago had been planned and built with primarily wood. And so the blaze killed about 300 people and injured many more. 3.3 square miles of the city of Chicago went up in the flames, and over $5.4 billion worth of damages in today's economy were had upon the city of Chicago. And again, uh, a hospital was needed. So they started the St. Joseph's Hospital. Uh, it was actually already under construction, uh, but they had to open it early. And so nurses who were training in this hospital, uh, and they had not received their licenses yet, but they were forced to uh, treat these patients with the knowledge that they had already. And so this really establishes a trend in uh, disasters happening, and then hospitals uh, obviously being uh, needed afterward. And this brings us to the New Ulm tornado of 1881. So this happened on July 15th, 1881. It was a really hot and windy day. And as most people were out doing their chores in the afternoon, they could see a storm uh, developing in the northwestern horizon. And later on, they saw another storm develop in the southwestern horizon. And shortly after, those two storms had merged, forming uh, quite the system. And it developed, and it started heading straight for New Ulm. And so a tornado, of course, developed out of this storm. And it tore through much of Brown County, causing tons of damages before it eventually reached New Ulm at about 4.45 PM. Uh, the storm itself was over New Ulm for about 15 minutes and the tornado for probably less than that. But even in that limited amount of time, the destruction was devastating. There was roughly $250,000 worth of damage at that time that equates to about $10 million in today's economy. Um, the famous landmarks in New Ulm, uh, such as the Howenstein Brewery and the Turner Hall, Turner Hall excuse me, suffered major damages. Uh, there were things like eyewitness reports about uh, human people being lifted up dozens of feet into the air. Animals were carried over a mile by this tornado. Um, I read recently that uh, a meteorologist actually researched this tornado, and if they had the rating systems back then that they do now, it would have been rated as an EF5 tornado, which is the largest that you can get. I'm just curious how in yeah. a valley, how it, do you know how it traveled into the valley? Yeah, I don't have this in the presentation, but I do have uh, actually a, a mapping of the tornado path. Um, I might have to uh, get that to see to you sometime if you want to talk to me after the presentation. Okay. Here are some photos of the damages. We can see downtown New Ulm on the left side. And on the right side, this is an overhead view of uh, the path, you can see uh, buildings are basically wiped out. Here is the Catholic Church. There was an artistic rendition done about this and then also a real photo. The steeple was uh, completely torn off, roof basically gone, trees uprooted. Some more photos. And here are two more artistic uh, renditions of some damage. We can see the Methodist church on the left completely <coughs> gone, and the drugstore at the time uh, basically unrecognizable. 
That being said, though, uh, the cleanup efforts were actually quite impressive. Uh, within weeks, uh, the citizens of New Ulm had gathered and cleaned up the city to a basically a functioning status at least. And many people contributed from afar, um, places like Milwaukee, Chicago, New York. I include Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm from Nebraska, so that's kind of a uh, <laughs> kind of a shameless plug there, if you will. <laughs> And uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars were donated from these cities far and wide. There was actually a newspaper article from uh, a New York uh, city councilman who uh, called for help for New Ulm, you know, uh, hundreds of miles away, and they had raised so much money, same with Milwaukee especially. Uh, that being said, though, um, you know, we can talk about the economic damages, but there were also six lives that were lost uh, in New Ulm and there were more elsewhere as a result of the tornado. Uh, listed are the names of those in New Ulm who passed away. Um, three of them were children. Uh, you can see the five-year-old son uh, and all the uh, things that I read, uh, the five-year-old son was unnamed. But then Eleonora Reitz and Annie Leash, they were both 10 years old. And then also on top of that, 53 other people from New Ulm were injured and some were quite uh, severely, uh, some were left crippled, obviously some broken bones. And this is actually a newspaper article directly after the tornado uh, uh, detailing some of these injuries. And so this again shows that after a natural disaster, uh, the need for a hospital becomes that much more clear. <clears throat> so after the hospital, or excuse me, after the tornado, uh, the Sisters of Christian Charity, who were in New Ulm, opened their doors and they sort of served as impromptu nurses for the local injured. They didn't have much medical training, but it was the best that New Ulm had at the time. But again, it became clear that permanent, permanent medical facility was needed. And so the efforts started to bring a hospital to New Ulm, but it was a pretty rough start. Um, during some meetings at Turner Hall in April of 1883, uh, the citizens felt that the hospital would probably not be self-sustaining and that it would be economically impractical. And so the initiative was basically dead from the start. However, uh, Father Alexander Berghold came to the forefront and he stepped in and uh, revitalized the efforts to uh, bring a permanent hospital to New Ulm. And he raised $433 for a fundraiser, um, it doesn't sound like a lot. It's actually a few thousand dollars in today's economy, uh, but it was a start, and the people of New Ulm really rallied behind him. And so after uh, he stepped in, it actually became a really quick uh, process. Uh, the contract was sold on August 18th of 1883, and by November 7th of that same year, they were already dedicating it. And they built it on the Western Bluff in New Ulm, which as we'll see, is actually where the New Old Medical Center is today. And when they dedicated it, um, they named it after its primary benefactor, Father Alexander Burkhold, and they named it St. Alexander's Hospital. And we can see an early picture of it there. This is the picture also that was on the flyer uh, for this evening's presentations. And so, uh, Father Burkhold, he operated it himself uh, while still performing his duties as a priest and a minister. And he administered the hospital with really good care. He actually ran a phone line from the hospital to his house so that he had constant contact just in case anything needed to happen. And the Sisters of Christian Charity, they lived actually in the upper floor of the hospital and they served as nurses on the main floor. Um, that being said, uh, it did fail within the first year. Um, they couldn't really uh, <clears throat> sustain it financially, uh, but it, it actually didn't really matter because uh, the poor handmaids of Christ stepped in after the Sisters of Christian Charity were called elsewhere. And the poor handmaids of Christ bought it for uh, $7,000, and they really got it going. They registered the hospital officially with the state of Minnesota, and they all received their nursing licenses themselves. And so uh, after they stepped in, uh, it would thrive for many years financially. Um, 
even though the hospital itself would go through a series of remodels and rebrandings, um, it stayed strong. And as I said before, the Newell Medical Center rests on the same land that St. Alexander's Hospital did in 1883. Do you know when it switched to Loretta Hospital? Uh, I believe that was in the early 1900s. I don't have an exact date on that, though. And so uh, this piece of history still lives on in New Ulm, and you can find that in just two of these historical markers. There's more places you can find this. Uh, but in the left one, this is where we can see a remembrance of the tornado as it describes the tragedies that have hit New Ulm. Uh, there have been plenty over its history, but we can see there's a quote at the bottom there. Uh, toward the end of that plaque, it says, uh, the town survived the catastrophes of the Dakota War in 1862, a tornado in 1881, and so forth. And then the statue of Alexander Burkhold, this can be found on that winding hill north of the uh, hospital, and it remembers him as the main benefactor for hospital, not just St. Alexander's Hospital, but also just bringing hospitals to New Ulm in general. And it says, Father Burkhold strove to initiate a community hospital along with many great other things about him. Uh, that's all I have, so thank you very much. And I think I have a few minutes questions. for questions, yes. If there is no questions, I can turn it over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Very nice job. Yeah. Yeah. As the hospital got bigger, did the um, nuns have uh, a kind of their own, and they had a building of their own, if I remember correctly? Uh, yes. So the Sisters of Christian Charity were the ones living in the hospital. I think when the poor handmaids took over, they didn't live in the hospital and they had their own place. Yeah, I thought there was two yeah. separate buildings. I think so, yeah. 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 Interest me, uh, the medical facility in Rochester resulted from a tornado as well two oh. years later. Two years later. And founded by nuns also. Very interesting. I should have included that. <laughs> <laughs> and in Germany, there is no word like nurse. Oh. They're all called Krankenschwester. <laughs> At that time, Lutherans as well as Catholics had nuns. And the took care of the sick. Mm -hmm. What's the German word again? Krankenschwester. Yeah. Uh, I don't know any German, but. <laughs> now we do. Yeah, now I do. <laughs> any other questions? Do you, know, the, oh. you know if those are the same nuns that did the uh, Way of the Cross? Oh, uh, I do believe, yes. I think those are connected. Don't quote me on that, but I got it. So. <laughs> well, if there are no further questions, I think I'll turn it back over to Professor Boggins. All right. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, next topic we have here uh, might seem like a very logical and easy one for one of our students to do because it's actually the history of the founding of Dr. Martin Luther College, except realize it wasn't as easy as you would think, although we have plenty of uh, probably documents buried in our archives up at the college. Our student wasn't able to actually access the archives at the college, so she ended up using the resources of the BCHS and then um, documents from the Wisconsin Synod, uh, which was connected with all this. So. Um, her research wasn't as easy as you might think, and uh, so she's going to explain to you why it is that New Ulm, of all places, ends up with a, a college of ministry located here. So our next presenter then is, is Emma Holson. Hello, I'm, I am Emma Holson. I have the delightful opportunity to be able to present to you today about the establishment of DMLC, which is also known as Dr. Martin Luther College. It is very familiar because it is the current building of Martin Luther College, except today he's lost his doctor. <laughs> All right, so in order to understand how it was established, we have to understand why it was established. So uh, there was the Minnesota Synod, which was a synod of Lutherans who, who basically had churches all around Minnesota and they basically came together every three years and 
basically discussed being able to have proper doctrine being together so that they can have pastors to work with multiple congregations instead of just one. And there was also the Wisconsin Synod, which did the same thing but in Wisconsin. Um, so the Minnesota Synod really wanted to train more pastors. Um, they had neglected an agreement to have pastors coming from Germany, so because they wanted to be able to finance pastors from their own cities to be able to uh, teach here in America in Minnesota. So the desire for that is hopefully let's have a seminary in Minnesota, but they were not that well, they weren't that well off financially. So they kind of seeked with fellowship with Wisconsin to be able to uh, have their pastors go to the seminary there in order to learn. And fun fact, the Wisconsin Synod happened to create a very beautiful and successful seminary in Watertown, Wisconsin in 1863. So it was about like the right time to have partnership for, for having their pastors go there. And it was a way to show fellowship that their doctrine was similar. But they did have but in the agreement they did have to pay five hundred dollars for every student who went there in order to be in order for them to actually uh, learn in, in Wisconsin, minus all of the traveling fees. Um, but this didn't really turn out that well because uh, that's, Watertown, Wisconsin is very far away. Even today, it's a very long drive. <laughs> and back then, you didn't have a lot of train routes going up over there, so you had to go by cart and buggy, and that took a very long time. And so a lot of young men were just like, I, I don't want to go to Wisconsin to like be a pastor, so they just wouldn't be a pastor. Or they would go off to a different, or just go to a non-denominational. So they were losing a lot of interest in that. And that wasn't really that great. And the pastors who did actually make the trip to Watertown decided to stay in Wisconsin because it was easier than coming all the way back to Minnesota. <laughs> so they kind of lost a lot of people in this deal. And they also, uh, they had financial problems. They couldn't afford the $500 a year. Um, especially with the 1873 to 1874, there was a major grasshopper plague in Minnesota which wiped out a lot of crops, and two of their congregations just were completely like, they were. They needed help, they needed funding, even the people in their congregations, they had nothing. So a lot of the funds that the Minnesota Synod had went to these congregations, so they didn't have $500 for every student in Wisconsin. So they kind of became in debt, and Wisconsin is just like, they let it slide, but they, they eventually was like, you need to start paying us again, but they didn't have money. And then they also were starting to differ on different doctrinal faith ideas. So some people thought this way, some people thought this way. But the problem is, is that Wisconsin decided we do not believe the same thing that Minnesota does in one of their conventions, but they meet every two years and Minnesota meets every three years. So when they decided that we don't want to have fellowship with Minnesota, Minnesota didn't even know. They had, to wait. <laughs> they had to wait another three years until like Minnesota met the next year and then they didn't match up. And so they had to wait like almost five years in order to, well four years, in order to like actually be like, hey, we're not doing fellowship anymore. So that was all kind of going on around this time. So it was a lot like, we have a seminary, no we don't. Uh, we have one in Wisconsin, not working out. So that kind of brings us to St. Paul's in New Orleans, Minnesota. Uh, this was the only Lutheran church in New Orleans at the time. <laughs> yeah, there was mostly Catholic and Methodist church, and there was this very small Lutheran church in New Orleans. And because of the tornado, and after the tornado in July 15, 1881, the congregation's building was completely destroyed. There was nothing left at all. So they had to kind of rebuild from scratch right after that. However, while they were rebuilding, their pastor unfortunately died. So they had to call for a new pastor. And they called from the Minnesota Synod, and they got a replacement who was C.J. Albrecht. And he began his ministry there on August 20th, 1882. And then two months later, they were able to dedicate a brand new building, which stands where St. Paul's <coughs> is today. So if you know it's a little bit down the road, that's exactly where it used to be. Um, this is a picture of St. Paul's. This is a little later on after they do some additions. But this is the closest I could get to the date. They didn't have a lot of photos of it. Um, uh, but C.J. Albrecht is very important because he personally thought that Minnesota should have a should have a seminary in Minnesota. But 
we're the Minnesota Seven. We're the Minnesota Synod. We should train pastors in Minnesota, not Wisconsin or anywhere else. And so he kind of talked about it with his congregation, and he had a lot of support by them. They're like, yeah, we should. So they're like, yeah, you should talk to the other congregations in town, just because the pastors went to like the different congregations, like in Mankato and all over. And so he talked to with it with the other congregations, and they also agreed, like, yeah, we should we should have a seminary in Minnesota. So it just so happened he became the president of Minnesota Senate <laughs> a year later. So now he has the power in order to talk about it to the entire Senate so that they can actually this can like come a reality. So his congregation urged him to be able to talk about that with at the conference. And so at the 80, 1883 conference, uh, he gave a report to the Senate just talking about how we're doing financially, if this is what we believe. And then he also included a proposition that they should create a seminary. That like it is it's it's time. We we're we're losing stuff, we're losing fellowship with Wisconsin, we don't really have anywhere, and we would like to have one in Minnesota. And he also and with this proposition, he talked he explained that the New Orleans congregation not only pledged four thousand dollars of their time, not this time. Of, of dollars and also land. They had already bought land for the seminary to be built on. They're like, we are ready for this. And so they just, all the pastors came around, there was about 20 or 30 of them, and they decided in a vote that they were, they resolved to establish a college, not a seminary, to be able to supply pastors and congregations in their mission endeavors. Why a college, not a seminary? Like we're, we're talking all about the seminary. Well, they believed that a college would be more beneficial to their congregations because in a college you can still teach pastors, but they wanted to follow more of a gymnasium design, which is a very old school design kind of from Rome. That they also wanted to be able to teach like business majors or any other kind of like degrees that would be beneficial for New Orleans. And other, like if it's beneficial to your congregation, they wanted to be able to teach it. So that's why they kind of focus more on a college than a seminary, but still act as a seminary with some extra benefits. Um, so they created a building committee in order to be in charge of, all right, how are we, where are we gonna make this seminary? I mean, college, it's like, how are we gonna build it? And so they were told that even though New Ulm offered a lens to build on, they're like, let's wait. Let's wait, let's, let's let other churches be able to like offer some land, offer some money, and just then we'll vote on which one we want, where we want to go. So they had until September 15th, 1883. And then they also very much stressed, this is stressed in a lot of articles, that they were not to build until they had $14,000 pledged, and half of that in cash because they were so much in debt already. <laughs> they didn't want to go back in debt for making a seminary. So these were the criteria that they had for making a new college. But they weren't really followed. <laughs> um, the New Orleans Congregation, St. Paul's, was so, they were so con convicted that like, yeah, they're going, they're gonna vote for this, yeah, they're gonna want a seminary. So they already just decided to start building before the conference even began. <laughs> so they they already had the land, so they already just broke ground. They're like, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna get this. And it's just it's like, yeah, they'll, they'll agree, they'll agree. There's no way they won't. So this will be 100% great. So they decided to start building kind of off, many resources say off Second Street, but at the bottom of the hill. Oh. So it's not that far away from where the where the hospital used to be. So that's around where they were trying to build. However, <laughs> when they started building, uh, whoever owned the land, they couldn't figure out who owned the land. <laughs> Although it was to the church, but then they're like, that's not Pacific enough. So for legal reasons, they had a halt building, and we're just like, man, we can't we can't build a seminary anymore. What are we going to do? We already pledged like land and four thousand dollars. But one of the congregation members, uh, I think it's E.J. Cook, um, he was like, you know what? I own some land. I own all this land at the top of the hill. I have this perfect plot that will just look beautiful. It's high up. It looks commanding. It would be a beautiful place to have your college. And I'll sell it for 100 bucks. 
And so he did. And the congregation was like, yeah, yeah, we can do that. It is legal. So they did. <laughs> and this is an 1886 map of New Ulm, one of the oldest maps I could find. And it actually, in this red circle, it's kind of blurry, but it does mention the college. It says Lutheran College, and there's only one Lutheran college in this town. And so that's about where it was in comparison to the rest of the city at the time. This is only two years after the college was built. So the fact that it's on that map is just amazing. Um, and so this is what it would have looked this is what it looked like. So you don't have the, the main street like like road up the hill. It's a little bit further to the right. But look how commanding it is. You know, his promise really went through. I mean, look how beautiful this German architecture style is in comparison to Watertown, Wisconsin. <laughs> like, come on, is, is, that, is that commanding such as this? I, I think it's better. <laughs> um, and so in 1883, they had the deciding vote of where should we go? And so, you know, the building committee, they found out St. Paul's was building already before they knew. Did they do anything to stop them? No. They, they let them go. And so in September, they had one other congregation come up being like, you can build in our city. And this was in Shakopee. If you don't know where that is, it's, it's a small town outside of Minneapolis. And they offered land kind of in town, $3,000, it's like, hey, look, we're by the big city, like, this would be really great for traveling. So they had New Wong versus Shakopee. And it was, uh, from many resources, it was basically about like three-fourths of a vote to New Wong. And so they officially had the Minnesota Synod's blessing. So now this is truly a reality. Well, they, which is great because they already were building there. <laughs> um, also, this is downtown New Ulm at the time, so after the repairs. And so, because this is now blessed, we can now lay a cornerstone officially. So, in July of 1884, about uh, eight months later, they had contractor H. Henshin. He laid the cornerstone, and C.J. Albrecht, the president and pastor of the area at the time, he consecrated it. Legend has in multiple news reports and also eyewitness reports that it's in the re in its receptacle is the symbol of the Lutheran Church, a Bible, a hymn book of the time, a catechism, the minutes of the synod's proceedings of where they voted to make the college, <laughs> and various U.S. coins. They never describe what coins. They just said U.S. coins. So if you find the cornerstone, let us know. <laughs> um, and the ceremony was concluded by Reverend N. Schultz's choir from Mankato. He had a lot of a lot of people from his congregation practice. It was a big it was a big celebration. We had multiple people coming from all around Min Minnesota, and some from Wisconsin just coming there, just singing praise and just being so excited. Uh, finally, we're having a college in Minnesota. <laughs> And this is kind of a up close and personal picture of the DMLC. Uh, it has a DMLC on the top, which I never knew about, because it's still there. It's just covered. So it's officially opened its doors on November 12, 1884, not even six months after it's after the cornerstone was laid. So and whenever it was opened, it was the largest celebration seen in New Orleans history. That is from the New Orleans Journal of the time. <laughs> so I'm going to say that that is true. <laughs> um, but the, you had Lutherans coming from all over Minnesota. You had them coming from Missouri because they were friends. Uh, and you had people coming from Wisconsin. You had thousands of people all like lined up all around just wor worshiping together and just being praising and being like, man, this is a beautiful college. Like, ah, oh, so proud. And so, and the day after, the classes started for both pastors and business majors. Not teachers, unlike what it's known for today. <laughs> However, they did start teaching later. Um, it was dedicated to Martin Luther because uh, 1884, uh, this was around Luther's birthday. So it was like a it was like a 400 year anniversary 
And I was just like, yeah, Martin Luther's birthday. We're making this Lutheran college. This is a sign. This is going to be great. So that's why they really wanted to finish in 1884. Um, and so it, the purpose was to pursue um, the educating for those to benefit congregations, so pastors, business people. And three years later, they sought teachers as well, because teaching was very important to a lot of the congregations. Having elementary schools was very important. And so they decided to include a teaching program, and they didn't allow women for another five or seven years, but they did, and today it is the highlight of, of Martin Luther College. <laughs> but uh, it wasn't then, it was more of a college, a uh, well, pastor. And you can kind of see on this white thing over here, that's Martin Luther College, they covered it up. <laughs> oh, how sad. But it now still stands to this day, despite losing me its doctor. When did doctor get, and why, when and why did doctor get removed? Okay, so in 1995, you, there was basically, um, uh, it was the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Senate. Minnesota and Wisconsin came together and created a whole brand new Senate. And they had, between the two Senates, they had a lot of seminaries, colleges, high schools, and so they decided to bring some together. So you had the Northwestern College, which was the one in Watertown. That, they combined that with Dr. Martin Luther College and created it into Martin Luther College in uh, 1995. So that's why some t-shirts say since 1995, and that's why I have some people say DMLC instead of MLC. So that's why there's some confusion, but yeah, it was actually Um, this is the end of, I would love to take any other questions. I do have a couple minutes. When did they start accepting women? Um, I th do not quote me on the, on the date, but it was like 19, uh, not 19, uh, yeah, no, early 1910s and such. So, yeah, they had to create a whole brand new dorm for them. And <laughs> when, when did they decide to house high school there? There was a high school there for a while. There, there, there was there. a high school there for a while. Um, and how long did it last? I do not know the exact date. Last year was 78, because my mom yeah. was the last. <laughs> 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 79, I'm sorry. 79. Um, I'm not completely sure. It's probably like 1930s or sometime after that, because a lot of the buildings weren't, they didn't really expand that much until like after like, after the first war, yeah. World War. So I cannot completely tell you, but I can tell you it's after that. Yeah. That stairway still? Yes. Okay. It's, it's still very much there. I'm sure a professor walks up those steps every I day. I walk up those steps even every day, even though it says they're closed for winter. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. Status, <laughs> yeah. Say it. yeah, they actually did a lot in the beginning. It, that was its sole purpose, and so it would take them only four years. They would do a four-year track there instead of the eight-year track they try now. Yeah. Yes, My great-grandfather started the MLC. Really? Albert, no, that was his great-grandfather. That's awesome. <laughs> so my great, 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 great. <laughs> <laughs> for you here and uh, this one I found rather interesting also when he got into this because his research has to do with a building uh, quite fitting for right now because we are soon closing down our armory in town as they're going to be building a new one so he did a history of the armory here in New Ulm which happens to fit quite well for him because besides studying to be a teacher he also happens to serve at that armory and uh, actually the armory we got the military.
military personnel were actually even fascinated in this whole thing because they said there is a history of many of the armories around the state of Minnesota, but there was none of, of this particular building. So his research is going to actually be staying there in the building. They're keeping his paper there even. So I'm quite excited to present to you Joel Holtz, who will tell you about the armory. my pleasure to present to you tonight. Uh, you said my name is Joel Holtz. I'm also Specialist Holtz. I've been serving, I've had the privilege to serve uh, in the Minnesota Army National Guard for the last three, just over three years now. Uh, I work in artillery, that's what we do at that armory there. I actually have to wake up early tomorrow and go to work. But uh, <laughs> So, um, when Professor Boggins suggested some ideas of what to do, like what, what should you do for a topic for this project? I saw a new home armory on there and immediately said, dips, mine, mine, no one else, mine. Um, I was like, yeah, let's go, I got this. And then I thought, what am I going to talk about? It's a building. I mean, what's going to be interesting about a building? Um, so I was kind of not sure where I was going to go with this. I thought I was kind of going to struggle. But then the more and more I got into this, I found that it actually has a very interesting history to the point I called it the struggle to build the new home armory because there's legal battles, financial battles, the people of New Alm getting at each other's throats over this. So um, it ended up being a very interesting project for me to start looking into. So the first struggle you have to decide when building an armory is you need somewhere to build it. Um, so this is around 1912, 1913. The state has decided they want an armory in New Alm. The city of New Alm is very much on board with this. They think it's a great thing for the city to have a new armory here. So um, in order to entice the state to make sure the armory comes to New Ulm, uh, one of the things they did, the city, was uh, agree to donate land to the armory. They said, well, we have plenty of land here. We'll gladly give some of our land to the National Guard so that you can build an armory here. So they were going to give away part of North German Park. Roughly one third of the park was going to be given away, and they were going to open the armory there. Well, a lot of the citizens of New Ulm did not like the fact that they were getting rid of a park. They liked having the parks in New Ulm. That is a very nice thing about New Ulm to this day. There's a lot of parks here. Uh, so they wanted to keep them. And so they didn't know how to stop this. If the city council is saying that the new armory is going to go in the park, how do you stop it? Um, so they brought a city attorney. City attorney Sumston is brought in. And so he starts looking it over, and he says, no, you absolutely cannot do that to the city. He says, this is not possible um, because this is a park. It has been dedicated as a park. There is no way for you to build on it. So he's trying to block the city from doing anything, um, to which the National Guard does not, they don't like that. They uh, want this land. They want to get things going. They want to build this armory. So they send a captain down. Uh, Captain Feister is his name, if I'm pronouncing it right. Um, he is brought down to uh, represent both the city of New Ulm and uh, the National Guard. And after talking, it gets brought to the Minnesota, Minnesota Attorney General, Attorney General Linden, uh, Linda Smith. So he actually has to decide what's going to happen in New Ulm. So they both bring their points. And what ends up being ruled is that as a city, you cannot give away land that has been dedicated to any purpose. You cannot use it for any purpose other than what it's dedicated for. I don't know if that's changed, but I've heard some things about that now in town. But you can't give away parks. That is a park. It will forever be a park. You cannot take that away. So now you're back to square zero because you don't even have anywhere to build this armory. But the people of New Ulm are going to try to step up themselves to help um, build an armory. So you end up with three different locations being offered up for the armory, and it becomes a very heated, intense battle between these groups of citizens on where to build, which I find kind of funny because you have the Southsiders who offer Minnesota and 2nd North Street, and the Northsiders who offer Broadway and 2nd North Street. So. They're across the road from each other, but I don't know what it was. They were not happy with each other. Um, so the Southsiders, they offer Minnesota and Second North, and it's completely free. 
they will cover the entire cost. There's uh, whatever the citizen who owned it was willing to take some money from people around him and they'd, they'd give it to the National Guard for free. Um, the Northsiders offer Broadway Second North for $1,800. It's a $3,800 property, but they raised $2,000 um, to offset the price. But they can't make up their mind about it. They're arguing about it for several months. Um, actually, during that time, we have a colonel coming down from uh, the National Guard Division headquarters. And if you don't know anything about military ranks, if you have a colonel coming, um, you might want to behave. That is a pretty high-ranking person <laughs> in the military. And he's basically coming just to say, figure it out, or we'll go somewhere else. We're getting tired of waiting, because now it's already into late 1913 that this is happening. Mm -hmm and they still don't even have a location, and they were trying to start building in 1912. Um, so, now you have the third property offered. If you remember City Attorney Sumson, the guy who prevented them from building in North German Park, now offers land of his own. I was not able to figure out exactly where that was. It just said, out of town near the water tower. I don't know if there was a different water tower, if it was out there. Some were further out of town. They are. Thompson? Thompson. My apologies. Um, so, City Attorney Thompson, if I make that mistake again, I'm sorry. I'm used to saying that for several months wrong. Um, so, you have three properties now. Where are you going to go? So, the City Council decides to vote. Um, they have to reach an unanimous decision on this. Uh, it takes three votes. The first one is for Broadway and Second North, the North Siders property. It is rejected, uh, four votes, uh, two votes to four, so um, then they vote on the Southsiders, and it's only one person votes for it. I'm not sure why they didn't like this property so much, even though it was free and across the street. So, and the third vote, they decide to uh, go with the Northsiders of Broadway and Second North Street, with the stipulation that there was the city doesn't have to pay maintenance pay payments on some of the property. The National Guard would make some contributions to that as well. So they decide to go with the Broadway and Second North property, also known as the Garden Street property. But the Southsiders are not done yet. They are not happy with this. They want their property across the street to get hit. So they threaten to sue the city on the grounds that the city is mismanaging its money because they're paying $1,800 for this property when across the street there's a chunk of land that is free. <laughs> Why on earth would you not pay, take the free property? So they threaten to sue. And what happens is um, the Northsiders get together, they raise another $500. Um, so it's down to $1,300 and the Southsiders decide it's not worth it to sue. And they withdraw the threats. They end up saying in the long run they end up saving the city more money and they think the Northsiders will feel the scars of a hard argument for years to come. Uh, I thought that quote was funny. But, so, now you have a location, so you can start building your armory. No, no you cannot. So at the time, the state of Minnesota agreed to provide $30,000 for the building of an armory, and New Ulm would provide $2,000. But it was going to cost at least $45,000 to build this armory. Because they wanted in New Ulm a building that was special. They wanted it, they, the act, actual quote was, a monument to militarism. They wanted to really show this power. Which is kind of interesting because at this time, this is right around, right before World War uh, I starts, and the United States was neutral in everything. We were isolationists a lot. Um, we stayed out of a lot of problems. But we wanted a monument to mil militarism. We wanted a fancy building. If you've ever looked at that building, it looks like a castle. They had to bring in an engineer and an architect to actually design that. It cost extra money. So they need mo more money. So instead of building a cheaper one, the armory in Redwood Falls that was built a few years before this only cost $18,000. Um, so you very easily could have built an armory for a lot cheaper. But no, that's not OK. <laughs> So instead of making it cheaper, we're going to change Minnesota law. We're going to raise a petition to the state to change a law. Because there was a law in 1913 that allowed for an additional $15,000 to be given to a city to build an armory. 
but New Ulm did not qualify because it only meant for cities where two different National Guard groups were joining into one, they would get additional money to build a bigger armory for the larger unit. New Ulm did not have two units joining into one at the time. It was just one unit. So we didn't qualify. So the citizens, you get like, they got about 300 signatures. They brought it before uh, one of the legislatures and it got brought before uh, the state and they agreed to change the law. So all it was is the city had to be in good standing, so debt-free, well-respected community. Um, they had to provide like a $1,000 down payment, basically, and then the state would provide the $15,000. Um, so now you actually have some money. $45,000 to this monument of militarism in New Ulm. So they finally start building it. Um, it has not really changed too much uh, to this day. Um, the asbestos is still on the walls, I can vouch for that, but, uh, <laughs> so they build it, they start, the construction doesn't start until 1916, uh, because they had a lot of problems getting someone who could actually put in plumbing and heating, uh, cause they wanted all indoor plumbing and they wanted all, they were trying to get electricity in, they were trying to start with that, it got very complicated, so it took a while, but they started building it, they build it to how it looks today, um, at the time it was one of the most impressive buildings in New Orleans. It stood towering over Broadway. People would notice it. Now I'm pretty sure most people just go, hey, look, Jimmy John's is there. I'm gonna go, stop, you don't have to get the army. But I still think it's a pretty cool building. It is probably the most, um, I wanna call it a hodgepodge on the inside because now that it's over 100 years old, you can see every round of new technology has gotten added into it. So where the ceilings are ripped out, you can just see wires of every kind crisscrossing and tangled because they continue to modernize it. Um, to make sure it could still suit the needs of a more modern military. that You have to have a lot more technology as time progressed. So it looks kind of funny on the inside, I'm not going to lie, but I like the building. Um, some of the features you see outside today, um, the, the front door, there only used to be one, and it was that. That was the only way to get in the front at all. And this used to be a place they held balls, and they had dances here. I found a bunch of different, I actually had some of the, uh, the songs that they were going to play, and the instructions about uh, how men were supposed to dress and women were supposed to dress. It's kind of an interesting look at like 1935 is when it had some of these balls they held there. But one of the big problems was they couldn't get people in and out of it quickly. It took forever because there's only one door. So on the side, there's a big ramp now. That was added. This is all coming in in 1943. They add all these changes to the side of that. Was added in 43? That's what, there was a staircase originally. Um, I'm not exactly sure when it turned into a ramp. I'm not sure why, because that ramp is definitely not wheelchair accessible. You will fall down. Um, it is very steep. I've fallen down it. I know how steep it is. Um, it's on the sled down. I, I believe it. When I was a kid, and we'd slide down that. Yeah. <laughs> One of the changes also 54 foot flagpole, which is still out there. Um, they added those, front, those big front doors because they stored uh, vehicles in there. Maybe that's why there's eight times the legal lead in that room. But uh, <laughs> uh, so this building is getting closed down soon. Um, the building that they built out towards Walmart Menards on the outside of town, that is not the replacement for this building. That's for the other unit that is in New Home, the one over by the old Quick Trip. Um, but our building, our new building, will start, well, should start getting built pretty soon. Um, and then eventually, within a, hopefully a few years, we'll be moving to our new building. Um, and that'll be the end. This is the oldest armory in all of Minnesota. It's the mm -hmm. oldest active armory. So even though it's old, it's kind of falling apart on the inside. I still really like the place. I'm glad to have had the opportunity to serve there. And I was very happy to get to research it and to just preserve some of the history of this building uh, before it finally shuts its doors and they don't really know what they're going to do with it still, I believe. It's kind of up in the air what's going to happen to it, so I'm glad I can preserve that history. So uh, that's all I have for my presentation. Where's the new one being built? It should be near the other new building. Yeah, all that empty space out there where you're going to be directly in the wind with no cover from anything. It's going to be nice and cool. <laughs> Good for training. It'll get you tougher. Anyway. Uh, are there any questions? I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Any. Who gets to decide what to do with the building? I do not know. I mean, isn't it on the historical register? One would think. Probably. I don't know. <laughs> I honestly don't know. You have, you have someone saying yes, it is. It is? It is. Okay. It is on the register. Yes, sir.
It is the most impressive architectural armory in Minnesota. And one of the reasons why it is is because the National Guard in Minnesota was founded by a new old guy. Yes. Oh. It was a bob letter. Yes. Huh? And that's why it was a kind of a state thank you. Up until 1950s, uh, Trinity High School, that was their gymnasium. Yeah. I played basketball there. I was center. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> I didn't know they, uh, one of the quotes from one of the articles was that this was going to be one of the nicest buildings in the entire state outside of Duluth or the Twin Cities. Um, the governor himself did come down for the dedication. They had the whole 21-gun salute uh, with artillery when he came in. Um, to dedicate it. I'll say one of my favorite features of the building on the inside, on one of the walls, they have the logos of all the units painted. All the patches are painted on the wall, which I like because it's just kind of a marker to keep track of all the different people who served here. So you don't know a lot of units like uh, from New Ulm have served in almost every major conflict since World War I. Soldiers have been there um, and worked to serve this country. Uh, so I think it's cool that that gets remembered along with all the other stuff there. There is actually a whole RPAT in the armory that the National Guard said I have permission to go through, um, but I need to find time as a student teacher to go look through <laughs> boxes of old documents. They also established the Brown County uh, draft uh, uh, office was there in that building from about 1939 on. Mm -hmm. Brown County draft board. Are there any other questions? What goes on in there right now? Right now, uh, so this is, my unit is HHB, one of the 125, which is headquarters and headquarters battalion. Um, so we have our whole battalion headquarters for all the ar other artillery groups in the southern Minnesota for the headquarters board. So it's kind of a weird mix of people who do different jobs. Like I'm in artillery, I'm a fire control specialist, I aim the guns basically. Um, but we have like medics, communication people, stuff like that. So we just do our training there every month. Um, so that's mostly what we do now. Uh, so one, one weekend a month is full. It's full. There's people that work there. There's, it's full-time staff. Since this is a battalion headquarters, there are people who work there full-time. And all units do have some full-time staff uh, just normally. So there are them, those people in that as well. We should give a tour of it. There should be, uh, honestly, uh, once they clean the lead out of the basement. But, uh, <laughs> yes, ma'am. How many people actually come like once a month here? Like how many people are in your battalion? Well, in our actual battalion, it's close to a thousand, but who actually drill here, it's like, I want to say 120 to 150. I honestly don't know the exact number. Um, I'm too low ranked to have to worry about that. But uh, <laughs> I just worry about like the 18 people Yes, sir. Where the new location is going to be. Was there any controversy to that, or did everybody agree where it would be? <laughs> I spent enough time digging into this controversy. So, like, to actually find the law that Minnesota changed, I had to dig through like 600 pages of legal records. And I don't know how to read laws because I don't speak that language. It's not English. But, uh, uh, so I did not have time to get into all of that. Anything else? Anything else? Yes, sir. So uh, I've toured it with uh, our committee of citizens in New Ulm, and our purpose was to see what it's like, and it, it's awesome. They have, they even have a little club down in in the basement that is kind of neat. I am actually, last month, I was elected as the treasurer of the club. Not by choice. I was the only name on the ballot, and I didn't put my name on there. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so anyway, that. the purpose of, of the committee uh, was to see if this building can be repurposed eventually. We don't want to see it turn into another George's. And um, so I think that the city of New Ulm will, will have an option uh, to, to take over this building. And personally, I think there's a, enough nonprofit organizations that need space in our community uh, that could that could use some of the space that will be in that armory. So eventually, in the next year or so, um, going to the city of New Ulm and 
and asking them to, uh, to own this building is, is, I guess, one of the goals. Well, I'm glad to know it's not going to be wasted. Like I said, I've gotten a little connected to this building now. I like it personally, so I, I don't want to see it fall apart. I like, I'd like to see it keep going. But, um. So if you would repeat that, that this is not part of the new armory that's being built. So there's, a, there's two units in New Ulm, technically. There is an FMS, a field maintenance shop. That is the one that's over by the old Quick Trip. It's where they store all the vehicles. It's their new building is the one outside of town right now. That's going to be a big repair shop. You can see like the big repair bay doors on it where they put vehicles in there. So that's what that is. They are attached to our battalion, but they're not technically with, it's one of those complicated military jargon things. <laughs> but um, we will have a new building out there eventually. But they got theirs first. They're building, they needed the space. That parking lot was way too small to drive massive vehicles through. I know because I have to do it. Um, it's a very tight space. so. It's very useful to have that new one and also more capacity to repair vehicles because vehicles break a lot in Minnesota. They don't like the weather, but. Um, Is there a timeline for the new? I don't know. Building? I don't know that. Hmm. Anyone else? Well, thank you. Thank you. Before I turn things back over to Amy here, I just want to thank all of you on behalf of our students for coming out and supporting them. Uh, the turnout here was just amazing. And in so many cases, you contributed more things to their discussion. It was great to hear uh, the comments from all of you also. So, so thank all of you for coming. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our, our executive director here, Amy Johnson. Hello. Well, there's definitely no competition for stage presence up here, so I'm not even going to try, but I want to introduce myself. My name is Amy Johnson. I am the executive director of the Brown County Historical Society. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. This is kind of the kickoff to our 2023 season, so we've got a lot of exciting things coming up. I hope that you can join us in the future. Um, these things are possible because of memberships and because of volunteers, and for very many different reasons. But um, if you are interested in membership, Lucy is back there, and she can help you out with that. Speaking of Lucy, she is also on the board and also a volunteer. So volunteers also make all of this happen. Um, in the back here, we have another new staff member. Her name is Jenny Filzen, and she is our volunteer coordinator. So if anybody has any questions about volunteering, you may speak with her. But Again, please stay tuned because we do have some really exciting things coming up and I am truly excited about 2023. So thank you for joining us. This has been a fantastic event. Thanks, to the presenters, to Professor Thank you for watching.